Okay, today's daf that we're learning today is daf pechet, a very, very interesting daf, a daf full of things that uh, some of them you learned many years ago or at some point in your lives you probably heard, some of them maybe not. Uh, very interesting stories, angels, Torah, um, threats, all sorts of interesting things. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Today's daf is sponsored by Josh Adler in honor of Dr. Rebecca Eisen's graduation from University of Toronto Medical School, Mazal Tov. And uh, hope that our, our learning will help um, bring about a, an end to the violence, the terrible violence that's going on right now in America. Okay, with that, we'll get started. Tashma, if you remember, we're still in the middle of Rabbi Yossi and the rabbis and their issue with what day did Matan Torah happen? What was the date? Everyone agrees it was on Shabbat. The question is, was it on the seventh day of Sivan, or was it on the sixth day of Sivan, which again was affected by whether Rosh Chodesh was on Sunday or Rosh Chodesh was on Monday. And if we look at these concepts of what's behind this, according to Rabbi Yossi, it actually makes a lot of sense. He wants Rosh Chodesh to be on Sunday and the Torah to be given on Shabbat. It's almost like a reenactment of the seven days of Rishit, right? Notice there's seven days leading up, ends with day number seven, again, connecting this idea of Matan Torah to Maaseh Breshit, almost it starts on Sunday, it ends on Shabbat, and Shabbat is the climax. Um, and that's, that makes a lot of sense. And then again, in the context of Masechet Shabbat, it makes perfect sense that it's here because Shabbat is remembering Maaseh Breshit. The building of the Mishkan was man's way of kind of creating man's own world, right? a way of man being the Yotzer, the creator. And we have this concept connecting. If you look at the rabbi's opinion, it doesn't exactly fit that model, although, because they say it started on Monday, but if you think about it, there's always an issue when we talk about the creation of the world, is it, what was the important day of the creation? Was it day number one, where God created the, began to create the world, or was it day number six, which was the day that man was created? And because that was the day that man was created, it often has a very significant, um, it's, it's the most significant part. And according to the rabbis, what is the day we got the Torah? On the sixth day when humans were created. So it shows that the Torah was given specifically to man. We're going to get back to this concept soon. That's where we're going to actually end the daf on the importance of man in the world and in, in the world that was created. And the idea that we have capabilities that are almost God-like capabilities and that the Torah gives us the power to be able to do that um, and therefore, this idea that it's on day number six of the month, replicating, again, replicating the creation of the world, but that it ends up on day number six. Now, why then wouldn't he say it starts, Rosh Chodesh was on Sunday, and the sixth day came out on Friday? So maybe the idea is to connect both these two concepts. Number one, day number six, because it's the day that humans were created. In addition, it happened on Shabbat, though, which is, again, a reference of the connection between God and and, and humans in this whole relationship. And maybe that's the idea of connecting it also that it happened on Shabbat, but it was the sixth day of the month. So maybe there's some idea there uh, behind this whole machloke. Okay, and it's both relate to the same concept, but in a different way. Tashma, we're still continuing with questions on each of the approaches. Ditanya b'seder olam. Seder olam is a, is a midrash that talks about literally, the Seder Olam. What were the generations? When did people live? How long? Etc. And all different dates of when things happened. So here they also describe, Nisan Shabo Yatsu Yisrael Mitzrayim Ba'al Ba'asal Shachatu Pischehen. So again, Nisan, the year they got out of Egypt, what they do on the 14th, they slaughtered the Pesach sacrifice. Ba'chamisha Sar Yatsu, on the 15th they came out. Bo'to Yom Erev Shabbat Hayan. Now yesterday we saw it was either Wednesday or it was Thursday. Here it says it was Friday. Okay, again, let's go back to our calculations. If Rosh Chodesh Nisan then was on Erev Shabbat, because the 15th is two weeks later exactly, it would also be on Friday. Then Rosh Yarcha Deir, what happens? It's two days later because it's 30 days, so 28 plus another two. So Rosh Yarcha Deir comes out on Chab Shabbat, on the first day of the, of the week, meaning on Sunday, right? We have Friday is Rosh Chodesh Nisan, Rosh Chodesh Iyar comes out on Sunday, and then Sivan, then Sivan, because there were 29 days in Iyar, that makes Sivan 
one day later in the week. So that comes out on Monday. So Kasha Rabbi Yossi. This matches the rabbis, but it's typical for Rabbi Yossi. Amar Lecha Rabbi Yossi, he could explain, Hamane Rabbanan he. You could just simply say, that source is the rabbis, right? That one goes with the rabbi's opinion, but I have my own opinion. Right? That was exactly what the rabbis did when we had the question on the rabbi's opinion from the other ones. They said, oh, that right says Rabbi Yossi. Remember, if someone says something, goes against a, a Tanaitic opinion, we can, if he has another one, right? And these are two Tanaim. So he says, fine, there's some right to the go like his approach, some go like my approach. Tashma, another source. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Bisheni ala Moshe, Biyahat. And now Rabbi Yossi is going to talk about the days that preceded Matan Torah, what happened. So the first day we already know, he got to the mountain, he was tired, right? He didn't start doing anything because he was too tired. Then, Basheni Allah Moshe Okay, we're going to see the Moshe goes up the mountain a few times that week. He went up on the second day of the week and came back down. Bashlishi Allah Biyahad. Again, went up, came back down on Tuesday of that week. Barivi'i, on the fourth day of the week. Yahad Vishuv Lo Allah. He went down and didn't go back up again until Matan Torah. Now, there's something strange missing here. If you noticed, all of them said, Allah v'yarad, Allah v'yarad, he went up, he came down. This one says, Yarad, he came down, but didn't say he went up. How'd he come down if he didn't go up? So they ask on this, they take a break in the bright and they say, Well, if he didn't go up, where was he coming down from? Ella, so they mean, okay, correct the bright, it meant, he went up and came down. Okay, so now Rabbi'i comes down. This is Rabbi Yossi. So what did he do on Rabbi'i? He told everybody, separate husbands and wives. On the fifth day, he built an altar. Right, remember, he doesn't go up to the mountain anymore until Matan Torah. So he builds a mizbeach. He sacrifices a korban. Friday, he didn't have any time. Okay, this is strange. It means... Okay, we don't know what this means exactly. So the first thing the Gemara assumes this means, and they're going to bring it as a question of Rabbi Yossi, my love, Mishum Torah, why didn't he have any time on Friday, right? Not because he was busy getting ready for Shabbat, like we never have any time on Friday, but the reason is because of the Torah, meaning he must have gotten the Torah on the sixth day. This seems to match the rabbis, but this is said in Rabbi Yossi's name. But he didn't have time to do anything else because he was busy getting the Torah. So they say, "Lo, you're wrong. Go back to what I suggested earlier, Mishum Torah Shabbat. No, Moshe didn't have time on Friday because he was getting ready for Shabbat, right? You think about what was he doing? No Shabbos clocks he was trying to set, no uh, food he was trying to cook, right? They had the man, no lights to set, right? What was he so busy getting ready for Shabbat? Unclear. Okay, sometimes, by the way, this is classic in a Midrash, they rewrite history according to what's going on nowadays, right? So in those days, they were busy getting ready for Shabbat. There were all these preparations. So they claim, oh, Moshe must have been doing the same. But one could say even the man, it says, um, or I forget exactly the wording there, but it seems that there was somewhat issue, things that had to be prepared with the man, and maybe he was busy with that. Either which way, right? She, she, he didn't have time. I always think back to this, this record we had when I was a kid growing up about these ants, and they just, they... You know, it's like Erev Shabbat. They say, sorry, we just don't have the time. You know, we're busy getting ready for Shabbat. So anyway, that's like, everybody thinks about Friday, busy getting ready for Shabbat. That's what you think about when you hear Friday. So anyway, right, it's what people always complain about in Israel, that that's the day that we have off, because instead of Sunday, right, it's not a day that you can really do anything because you're always busy getting ready for Shabbat. So anyway, not a question, and therefore we're okay. So you could still say that on the seventh day, they got the Torah, and that was Rabbi Yossi's opinion. Uh, there was someone from the Galil who came in front of Rav Chista and said the following drasha. Baruch Rahmana Baruch Hashem, right? Blessed is God. To Yahiv or Yan Tulitai, he gave a three-part Torah, La'am Tulitai, to a nation that was three. We'll talk about what all these things mean in a minute. Al Yidei Tulitai, by the third. Biyom Tulitai, on the third day. Biyarcha Tulitai, on the third month. So they say, Keman Kirabanan. Who does this go like? This goes like the rabbis. Okay, we'll see why in a second. Let's just go through all the details. So, God gave a three part Torah. Okay, we can come up with a few different interpretations. One is Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, the Tanakh. Okay, it's three parts, even though he didn't exactly get that all at Har Sinai. Um, it could be there's 
um, Torah Shebikhtav, the written Torah, Torah Shebaal Peh, the oral Torah, and Torah Tastarim, like the Nistar, the hidden Torah, like Kabbalah. Some people say there's Sipurei Torah, there's stories, there's mitzvot, that's two, and then there's hidden things like the Maseh Merkava, okay, um, right, wooden, in Yechezka, we talked about that the other day, about how that's a whole different, right, that's the Olam of the Kabbalah, the Nistar. Um, okay, so a three-part Torah. By the way, this is, it's always in the Gemara, like an Elo Meshuleshet. It's, it's the most respected thing, something that either has three or it's the third or something like that. So you have a three-part Torah. To an, a nation, that's three. What does that mean? To Kohanim Levi'im Yisraelim, right? We have three sections among our people. Um, or maybe there's some other reason. Al Yidei Tilitai. Now, what's the Tilitai? Al Yidei Moshe. Moshe was the third in his family. Okay, there's something about anyone who's a third child. There's something special about the third, according to this. The Yom Tilitai, on the third day. Okay, now what's this the third day? The th no one thinks they got the Torah on the third day of Sivan. So what does it mean the third day? The third day after God told everyone to separate. Who does this match? The rabbis, because the rabbis said they only had to separate for two days and they received the Torah on the third. Okay, so that's that. And B'yarcha Tilitai in the third month. Okay, so who does this go according to? The rabbis. It's very interesting. Until now, they keep bringing up right to as questioning each approach. This one, and then they would say, oh, don't worry, that matches that opinion and it's okay. This one, for some reason, instead of bringing as a question, they just kind of stated as this follows the rabbis. It's just a structural difference, I'm not sure why. Okay, here comes one of the most famous midrashim that I assume most of you know. Now that we talked about Matan Torah, we're going to talk about all sorts of things that happened in Matan Torah, some things that happened after Matan Torah, right? The most famous was Chet HaEgel happens immediately. They start worshiping an Egel, right? They do a Hodazera right after they got the Torah. How could that possibly be? We'll talk about that. So they gathered it sounds like at the bottom of the mountain. Now, at the bottom of the mountain could mean right, un next to the mountain, but at the bottom could also mean underneath the mountain. So here comes the famous Midrash. God put the mountain on top of them like either a tub or a barrel, okay, and basically forced them to accept the Torah. Right? He hung it over their heads and said, if you accept my Torah, great. It's like putting a gun to their heads. Be love, sham to hate for them. And if not, there will be your burial place. Okay, right? You'll be crushed under the mountain. Some people say it doesn't make sense. It says sham to hate for them. It should be here and not there. So what does it mean there? So some people say this is a reference to future generations. That wherever you are, if you don't accept the Torah, that's going to be where you get buried. Okay, so. From here, we have the best claim why we don't have to keep the Torah. It was forced upon us, right? We never accepted it. So this isn't a good thing, right? If we all claim, oh, we don't need to do the Torah because it was forced upon us, that's not so good. So Sorry, Even though they were forced at that point, later on in history, they reaccepted. Hador means they Right. They went back and they reaccepted it in the time of the Purim story, Dirtiv, as it says at the end of the Megillah, Kimu Vikiblu Ayudim. What is Kimu Vikiblu? Right? It sounds very much like now seven Ishma. Kimu Masha Kiblu Kval. Okay, they they reaffirmed what they had already received. Okay, and that's how we, we respond to this. Now there's a big problem with this, which is even if we say that ultimately we accepted the Torah willingly. And therefore, we can't claim anymore, well, we were forced into it. Still, you have this problem between this Midrash of Kafar Lehem Harki Gigit with what it says in the Torah, Na Seven Nishma, and what we always talk about, Na Seven Nishma, we're going to even see Drashot about it now, which is that the Jews accepted the Torah wholeheartedly without asking questions. They said, we'll do, and then tell us what we need to do. So how do, how do we resolve this? So a bunch of different explanations are given. One is found in the Midrash Tanchuma that now seven Ishma is the written Torah, and Kafar Lehem Harki Gi'id is the oral Torah, okay, what was passed down and wasn't written. Tosfot says, okay, if you look at the first Tosfot on the page, it says, first they said now seven Ishma, but then God was worried that when they saw the big fire, and we'll see sort of all these Midrashim later that talk about this, they were going to get scared and they wouldn't want to accept the Torah, 
and therefore God forced them into it. In other words, they did say Nasev and Ishma, but later, either there was a possibility that they wouldn't, or maybe they didn't want to later on. Um, there's that option. There's another option that Nasev and Ishma were the people that were there at the time. Kafalem Harkigit was that not only is this for you, but it's also for future generations that maybe theoretically the Nasev and Ishma was we're willing to, we don't know about our children and people who aren't here today, and that according to the, the Kafale and Harkigigit, it was, well, God said at that moment, well, not only are you accepting it, but you have to accept it for all the future generations on behalf of everyone who's gonna come after you. Okay, so again, the question is a better question, and one could simply say different approaches, except you, it's hard. Naseb and Ishma, we say Naseb and Ishma means what it means, because we've learned that, and that's how we've been taught. Maybe one could understand the shot there somewhat differently, and maybe it didn't mean exactly that, and maybe there did need to be some sort of coercion going on there. Anyway, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, okay, going, moving on now. So now we are about halfway down the page, right in the middle. Amar Chizkia, my dechtiv mishamayim hishmat adin, eretz yara'a v'shakta. Okay, so here's a pasuk where it talks about, it's a pasuk in Tehilim. And it says, from the heavens, you talked about law, that, that would be Matan Torah, right? When the heavens, the law came out. And when that happened, Eretz Yara'av Shakta, the land feared and was silent. Now, generally, the assumption of this Gemara is going to be, when you fear something, you're usually not silent. You start screaming, you make a noise, you get worked up. You're not, Shketa is usually calm, peaceful. That's not the same as fearing. So, Im Yara'a Lama Shakta, Im Shakta Lama Yara'a. If, it was, if it, the lamb was fearful, then why were they silent? And if they were silent, why were they fearful? That's, the two don't work together. Ella. So you'd have to explain it like this. First they were fearful, then they were silent. Okay, the lama yara'a, why, were they, why was the land scared? Kidrish Lakish, as Rish Lakish says, to Amar Rish Lakish, my dirti vayer vayiboker yom hashishi, all the days in creation, it says, vayer vayiboker yom rishon. Why does it say by Yom Hashishi, Yom Hashishi, okay, and not Yom Shishi? Hashishi means the sixth day. So, what do they learn from here? Hey, Yitera, Lamali, what's the extra hey for? If from here we learn that God made a condition with the, with the the Maaseb Reishi, with all of the creation on the sixth day, and said, again, the significance of the sixth day when humans were created, and said, Im Yisrael makabalim ha-Torah, atem mitkaimim. If the Jews, I'm, I'm conditioning creation of the world on the Jews accepting the Torah. If they accept the Torah later on, you're great, you'll be, you'll survive. Vim lav, ani machzir etchem l'tov avo. And if not, I'm returning you to the way things were before creation, where it was all chaos. Okay, so now, they were yara'a because they were fearful that the world may be destroyed. When the Torah happened, then shakta. Okay, then the land calmed down. Tarash Rabbi Siman. Yisrael Yisrael Naseh Nishma. Now we get to Naseh Nishma. When they first said, we will do, and then we will hear, it was this amazing moment. And what happened at that moment? Okay, now we're going to talk about angels. Ba'u shishim ribo shamalachei asharei l'chol echa v'echa Yisrael. Six hundred thousand angels descended from the heavens, one angel per person, and put two crowns on everybody. One for Naseh, one for Nishma. Seems like the crowns were shining type crowns. Okay, they they shone, and everybody got one. What happened though? Kevan shechatu Yisrael. But what happened immediately after they sinned with the Cheta Egel, the golden calf? Yardu Mabesrim Ribom Alache Chabala, double the number had to come down. And we'll talk about that in a second. Upirkum, and they removed all the crowns. Now we need each one to remove right, one per crown. Okay, before the good angels came down and put two. Now we need double the number, each one to take one. Some people say Malache Chabala are not as strong as Malache, the, the good angels, like the bad angels are weaker, and therefore they needed more of them. Um, I thought of it maybe the, it's the, what, sometimes you do something good, which is great, but when you do bad, you undo the good in such a bad way that it needs, it, it's undone in a very terrible manner, right? We had, imagine, double the number of bad angels coming to destroy, right? That's not a good thing. 
Where do we get this from? It says in the section after Cheda Egel, after they sit with the golden calf, it says they removed their, or they stripped themselves of their jewelry from Har Chorev. What jewelry? Must have been these, these uh, crowns that they received. Right? In Chorev, they put them on. In Chorev, they took them off. Right? That's another name for, for Sinai. As we said, the angels came down, and okay, this we already know. What happened to all these crowns? Okay, this is interesting. If we say that they were shining, now we're going to explain what happened to them. Moshe got them all, and he took them. How do we know this? What happened? Moshe took his oil, and he put it outside the machaneh. Okay, that's what happened after Cheda Egel. And that's when God says, you know, I'm going to make you into your own nation. And it's this idea, he kind of took everything and it was all going to be from Moshe. And that explains, some people say, why Moshe Karan or Panav. His face was shown was because he had all these 600,000 times two, right, crowns of light. Amarish Lakish, Atir HaKadosh Baruch Hu Lanu. Now Moshe got them all, but eventually they're going to come back to us. How do we know this? Shenema. Right, so all the people who are in captivity are going to come back. They're going to come to Israel with happiness. With the happiness of the world on their heads. Now, what does it mean, the happiness of the world? It doesn't mean the happiness of the world. It means the happiness from, from time, a long time ago. Okay, me'olam, it was a long time ago. That will be al Rosham. They're going to come back with these crowns that they got at Matan Torah. Amar Rabbi Elazar, B'Sha'ash Yigdimu Yisrael Na'asel Nishma, Yatzda Bat Kova Amra Lehem. Okay, now, when B'nai Yisrael said Na'asel Nishma, all of a sudden, a heavenly voice comes out and says, Amra Lehem, Mi Gila L'B'nai Raz, Mi Gila L'B'nai, Raz Zesh Amalachea Shareit Meshtam Shimbo. Who told this secret that it's the angel's secret. Those words, Naseb and Nishma, are words of angels. Who gave it to people, to humans? That's something the angels say. How do we know it's something the angels say? Here comes the important words. They do the word of God, and they hear the word of God. Notice the order. First it says they do, then it says they hear. Basically, they stole, it's almost like they stole this from the angels, but it's also a way of saying that the people were on the level of angels on that day. Okay, again, we're going to get back to the comparison of angels to humans. We'll start with it at the end of today's talk, and we'll continue with it more tomorrow with a very famous midrash. Okay, okay now we're talking about a verse from um, Shira Shirim, we're going to quote a bunch of verses from Shira Shirim, which is considered an analogy of the Jewish people and God, the relationship between them, which was really f- happened at Matan Torah, right? One of the ways it was, it was uh, strengthened was at Matan Torah. So here they say, why, is, why are they compared to a tapuah among the trees? What's unique about an apple tree? Why were they compared to an apple? What happens with an apple tree? It's different from all the others. How is it different from all the others? First, it buds. Okay, again, there's different ways of explaining this. It sounds like first the fruit comes out and then the leaves. That doesn't really make any sense. But it seems like first it buds and then the leaves grow on the tree. Okay, I don't know if this is exactly true. In the Quran, they seem to say it is. Tosfot quotes Rabbeinu Tam, who says this is definitely not the case. And this isn't the way apples grow. And he, they, Rabbeinu Tam claims that the apple is not an apple. Tapuach doesn't mean apple. Surprisingly, it means an etrog, he says. Okay, some, or maybe some sort of citrus fruit. Right? The, the etrog is known that it's dar mishana it, 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 it stays on the word tree for the year. There's a whole bunch of different interpretations of what exactly that means. But the way he understands it is since the tree, the, the fruits kind of it buds a number of times a year possibly. So because of that, there's fruits all year round so that you can depending on how you look at it, you can see the fruits come before the leaves, okay? It's unclear exactly what this is referring to. Anyway, we'll just leave it at that. But what does it show? The tapuach tree is different from all the others. Likewise, the Jews were different from all the other nations, right? This is a page that's basically showing 
how different the Jews were from the other nations, and we're going to see a lot more of this later, that they accepted the Torah, and they accepted it in a blind kind of way, right? Where they said, okay, There was a Tzduki, right, one of these sects that didn't believe in Torah Shabbat Peh, says to Rava, he sees Rava learning, and what does he see, right? Learning Torah Shabbat Peh, like the oral Torah, he has his hands underneath his knees. Right? He's like either scratching them or, or rubbing them or something. And they're full of blood, okay? He's basically struggling through his Torah and it's coming out in his hands or something and, he's, and they're, they're full of blood and he doesn't even notice that he's bleeding. Amarle, Ama Paziza, you're, now here we're going to see, now Sef Nishma is not necessarily viewed as a positive thing. He says, you're some rash, you, you act without thinking, okay? Right, your mouths act before your ears, right? One could say, now, seven is not a positive thing, right? What do you mean? You say, I'm gonna do before you even hear, right? That's, that's, that's really uh, impulsive. So, you're still acting impulsively. First, you're supposed to hear. Imitzito, kablitu, and then decide. If this works for you, great, then accept it. Be low, low kablitu, and if not, then don't. Amarle, so what's Rava's reaction? It sounds logical, what he's saying. Rava says, Anan de sagigim muta, ktiv amban, us who we act, we tom lev, we act with, with a, how would you say it, with, um, with a full heart, right? We go into it wholeheartedly, so it says about us, Tumat Rashaim Tanchen. Okay, Tumat is not to die. Tumat is the, the, um, the complete faith of the Yesharim, of the straight ones. Tanchen will lead them. They'll be led by their complete faith. If you go with complete faith with God, you'll be led on the correct path. That brings us to a good place. But Hanachinashe, but people like you, the Sagam Baliluta, that work in, in crooked ways, or you work with deceit, You'll be destroyed by it. Okay, so basically, we're in a good place. Okay, now this is a strange pasuk. It says, right, I will be pulled, drawn to you through, you know, through, I will, I will become beloved to you through one of your eyes. One of your eyes. That's a very strange thing. So what do they say? Bitchila, again, this is a, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Um, this is a, a mashal, I can't think of the word. It's a mashal for the Jewish people and their relationship with God. Okay, so the Jewish people are going to draw God to be loving, to be beloved to her, right, to the nation, through one of her eyes. So what does it mean, one of her eyes? Bitchila be'achat me'enayich. L'chishetasi b'shte enayich. First, Right? First, God loved every... Oh, thank you, parable. First, God was drawn to us through only one of our eyes. Now, we didn't look great in the eyes of God yet. It was only through one of our eyes. But once we start keeping the Torah, then it's ready with two eyes. Okay? Amar Ula. Aluva kala mezana betochupata. Now we get to a negative line. We're praising the glory of the Jewish people. They said, Nasevenishma. They were so... You know, they went betom lev. They, they were amazing. Now all of a sudden we're pointing out what we mentioned before about this Chet Egel. What's the worst part about Chet Egel? It's like a kala, okay, a bride going to sleep with somebody else on the night of her wedding, right? That's a crazy idea. So, so aluva kala maznabatochu pata, right? How despicable is such a thing? Amr of Mary, Bera de Bat Shmuel, okay, the son of the, the daughter of, of Shmuel, the grandson of Shmuel. My kra, what's the Pesach that shows this? While the king was still in his party and in his glory, the smell already dissipated, right? The smell of the bisamim was no longer there, of the spices. That's an image, an anal- a par- or a parable, or an image of the Jewish people that they were still in the party, in the glory of Matan Torah, and yet they left God. But when God talks about us in that way. Notice the words he uses. He says, natan recho, that means the, the smell left. Dichtiv natan velo ktiv hisriach. Didn't say there, it rotted, the smell went bad, went sour. It says it left. 
Okay, so there you see that it, that it basically isn't this terrible thing that, right, even though we did this terrible thing, God still loves us, okay? And he doesn't treat us as if his sriya has a petrified, but that it, that putrefied, but that it, that it still, it just dissipated, okay? Tano Rabana. Now that we mentioned this aluva kalam azna betochu hata, they want to darshan this word aluva. Aluvim ve'enan ovim. Aluvim means you basically got, um, the word you were put down by somebody. Benan ovim. If somebody puts you down, one of the immediate reactions of someone is to put down either that person, or you, if someone insults you, you insult them back, or you insult someone else. You feel like, okay, well, that person's you know, got one up on me, I'm going to get one up on somebody else. But if you are insulted by someone and you don't insult back, shom'im cherpatam benan mishivim, or somebody criticizes you and tells you all the bad things and you don't respond right away and say, oh no, that's not true, I didn't do that, or that's not me, or, or try to give some excuse. If you do the mitzvot out of love and you're happy even when you suffer, the Pasuk says about them, these are the people who God loves, or the people who love God, or who God loves, are like the sun that comes out in its glory. Okay, this is, by the way, an analogy, this is a, a reference to a famous story that we saw about the sun and the moon, and originally God created them equal, and then the moon came and said, how can there be two rulers? And then God said, okay, fine, well, you ask, so I'm going to make you smaller, and I'm going to make the sun greater. So that's the image here of the sun, right, it has the humility, and therefore the sun came out as great, as opposed to the moon, who ended up being, um, and that's why they say the moon gets smaller and smaller um, over, you know, over the month, the course of the month. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, my dichtiv, Hashem yitain omer ha-mevasrot sabar rab. And now we're going to go back to Matan Torah. And we were always connected with it, but now we're going back to the actual Matan Torah and the giving of the dibrot, of the Ten Commandments. God spoke, he gave a speech, right, a word or a speech, and mevasrot sabar rab. Each omer, each uh, statement of God was kind of announcing a tzavarav, a huge army. How do we touch in this? Every single divra commandment that God spoke split up into 70 languages. Now, what's the importance of this? The importance of this is, again, this is all about claiming the Jews' rights to the Torah. The other nations can't claim we didn't know anything about the Torah, wasn't in the language that we spoke. The idea here is that the divrot actually were spoken in every language. Again, the other nations weren't there. This is all an image, but the idea that it was accessible to them and they could have accepted it and they chose not to. Tani did, right? This is always the, the, the struggle between, on the one hand, it was only given to the Jews. On the other hand, the Midrashim tried to say, well, it was offered to the non-Jews. They could have, they just didn't want it right, which is the famous Midrash about that God went around to all the nations and they said, oh, it says this, we can't keep it, right, and all that. It's the same kind of idea here. This passage could be understood in different ways. That it's about the hammer that either can split a rock into many pieces or a rock can split the hammer into many pieces. If you try to hammer a rock, it'll cause the hammer to... Uh, to break up into pieces, either which way we look at it. Ma patish zen just like the hammer splits up into many, many pieces, which again could be the hammer or the hammer splits the rock into so many pieces. Again, the same idea. Each one, and we're going to talk about the significance of each dibra, was a whole thing in and of itself, and each one split up into 70 lishanot, to 70 languages. Amar of bar papa. Okay, this is a reference to the Torah. If the Torah was like Nigidim, Nigidim were rulers. Okay, big important people. So why is the Torah compared to rulers? What can a ruler do? He can decide. Is someone deserving of death or is someone going to live? This is what Rabbi said. If you go in the right way, right, right meaning right and left, but right meaning the right way, the correct way, then it will be a medicine that will keep you alive. But if you go to the left, which basically means you don't take it very seriously, it can be a drug of death. 
right? We all know if you think about what's the analogy here, drugs can kill you and drugs can help you, right? It depends how you use them, how you take them. If you take two drugs that shouldn't go together, you'll, you'll die. If you, you know, depending on what you do, you could cause a lot of damage. So medicine can both harm and it can also obviously help you. So therefore, it's like, that's like, uh, that's an analogy to the Torah, that the Torah can bring you life, but if you don't use it properly, it can cause your death. So therefore, it's like the Nagid, the ruler who can decide life or death, likewise the Torah. Davar acher, a different drasha on the nigidim. Nigidim, kol dibor v'dibor sheyatsa mipi ha-kadosh baruchu, koshrim lo shnei k'tarim. Nigidim have crowns. This goes back to the, what we saw about the crowns, that they each got, we, each dibor, this is similar but a little bit different, each dibor that came out of God's mouth, they, they, the people were tied with two different crowns. The nasev v'nishma, right? That they kind of said to each dibor, nasev v'nishma. I'm a Rabbi Yashob and Levi. We're now going to start a whole slew of statements of Rabbi Yashob and Levi. In Daf Mishalahem this week, Shirin Chamutal talk about on the on our site. They talk about specifically Yoshua ben Levi, who he was, what he, why, why then they come up with a theory as to why he's mentioned here, based on things they know about him in his life. I'm a Rabbi Yashob and Levi. My dechtiv tzror hamor dodi li ben shaday alin. Again, a pasuk from Shira Shirim. Okay, tzror hamor is the the more is the spice. My dodi is like the spice, Bain Shaddai Alin, he lies between my breasts. Amra Knesi Israel of Nakadash Baruchu. They're now going to dash in Sror Hamor in a different way. Okay, they're going to use it negatively. The root of these words is negative. Sror is like Sorer, someone who oppresses, and more is mal, bitter. So Amra, so the Jews said Takadash Baruchu, Ribano Shalom, Apapisha Metzero Memerli, even though you were bad to me. You, you caused me, you were not bad, but you caused me the struggle. You caused me bitterness. Now, when is this? After Chera Egel. Okay, no, it's not, it's not exactly fair. They're saying God caused me this, but basically after Chera Egel, God caused us to be distressed and wanted to destroy us. Do, um, but despite that, Bain Shaddai Yalin. Okay, what does Rashi explain, right? You'll still lie in, uh, in my breast. Rashi says that this is a uh, reference to the fact that God gave them the Mishkan, right, after it built. Right? There's a whole debate about was the Mishkan given to the Jewish people after they got the Torah, or was it given after they sinned it, the golden calf, or was it given before? Is there Mukdamu Mulchar Torah? Do we go by the order of the Torah, where actually the Mishkan was commanded before? Some people say actually it was really commanded after, and it was written in the Torah before. Anyway, the idea being that the Mishkan was, a, was kind of a, an appeasing of them after, that God said, I'll still dwell among you. And what's the reference to the breasts? It's the badim, the poles of the Aaron, jutted out into the parochet, okay, according to the, the Gemara. And they, it looked like two breasts coming out. If you looked at the Heichal toward the Kodesh Kodeshim, you would see these two things coming out that looks like the breasts of a woman, a woman and that's what they're saying, Ben Shaddai Alin. It's a reference to the Mishkan. Eshkol hakofer dodi li bekarmei en gedi. Okay, what's this pasuk? This is again a pasuk from Shira Shirim. So Eshkol is a reference to Shehakol, okay? Mi Shehakol Shelo, the one who has everything. Mechaperli alavon gdi, hakofer and engedi. Okay, so God helped us atone for the golden calf. That's the gdi, is the golden calf. Shekaram tali, shasaftili, that I gathered to me. Meaning I did the cheda egel and God helped me atone for it. My mashmadai karmi lishna dermach nitshu. Where do we get the fact that karmi is the karmi and gedin is a reference to that I gathered? Amar mazutra bereidu of nachman kiditzan as it says in the following mishnah kisek shal kovesha kormi malav etakelin. Talking about a chair of the launderer who gathers there all his vessels. So that's just a proof for the word. Amar rabbi yashov ben levi. My dechtiv lechayav ka'arugat abosim. His cheeks are like the the arugat abosim, like the place where the spices are. His cheeks, where the words came out of when God spoke, again, this is just personifying God, even though we can't personify God, but when his cheeks spoke, the entire world, each dibor, the entire world filled with the smell of the sami, of spices. So then the Gemara asks, well, we have a bit of a problem. If every time God spoke one dibor, each of the commandments, the whole world filled with spices, where was the next smell going to go if all the world was already filled with the, the smell of the first? 
So Hotziah Kadosh Baruch Hu Aruch Me'otzorotam, basically God took out the smell from his treasure chest. Vahaya Mabir Rishon Rishon. Because each one, he would take out the smell, and then he would move it on. And then he would take out the new Dibor, and it would fill the world with a new smell, and it would go on. Shnemar, Siftotav Shoshanim Notfot Mor, right, that the mirror comes out of his mouth like Shoshanim, more, um, Notfot Mor Over, Al Tikhei Shoshanim Ela Sheshonim, that they go over and over. So each time a new one came out. Am Rabbi Yashob and Levi, Kol Dibor V'Dibor, another thing he says about each Dibra, each commandment, Sh'yatsam Mipi HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Yatsdan Nishmatan Shal Yisrael, they died in between each Dibor. It was going to be strange if they died in between each Dibor, how were they alive for the next one? Okay, in other words, it was so powerful that they basically died. Shneemar, Nafshi Yatsa B'Dabro. Okay, it says, my, my nefesh left me when God spoke. Umeachar Shemi Dibor Rishon, Yatsdan Nishmatan, Dibor Sheni Ha'ach Kiblu, how'd they get the second one then? In between each one, God put down, let down a dew that was in the future is going to bring people back to life. Likewise, here it brought them back to life. You were weak and God strengthened you. They jumped back 12 meals. Okay, they, they, you know, they did about, it, it was so powerful, they couldn't handle it. And here come in the Malachim again. By, you know, instead of the Malachim standing up against them and saying, what are you taking our words for? In this case, the Malachim helped them out. They would push them forward. If they didn't want the next one, right? The, the angels kind of pushed them back to the mountain. Okay, they, they prodded them. Here comes the famous story. We'll start it just for a bit today, and then we'll continue this tomorrow. Moshe goes up to, to the heavens to get the Torah. Okay? Here we have this human going up to the heavens. What happens when that happens? So, what is a human doing here? It's interesting the way they describe it, right? Someone who was born from a woman. What are they doing up here? Almost right now, it, it goes into my mind, that story of the B'nai Elohim and the B'nai Adam, where the Malachim came down and, and had relations with the women in the, in the, parak, uh, the sixth parak of Reshit, right? It's almost like, what's, what's going on here? We're not supposed to mix these things. Amar lahem l'kabel Torah He came to get the Torah. Amru l'fanav, chem da genuza shegenuza l'chad shameot v'shivim v'arba'a dorot. Kodem shenivra ha'olam, atam v'bakesh l'nal v'basar v'adam. You have this special treasure you've been saving for a thousand generations. This is from Torah Tziv- Davar Tzivala Elif Dor. For a thousand generations. Now what happens, Rashi explains, it based on the Gemara, it says that God was supposed to give the, it was supposed to be a thousand generations, was supposed to pass to Matan Torah. In fact, it was only 26, because God saw that they weren't gonna manage without the Torah for all those generations, and therefore said, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna not create, it was basically waited 974 generations before creating Adam Rishon in order to basically not have so much time elapse before the Torah was given, because the world wasn't going to be able to exist that long without it. So they said, you've been waiting all this time. Before, even before you created the world, you waited 974 generations. And now, Ma Adam Who's God and who's man? They're nobody. Okay, now this is all coming from Peretilim, Peretchet. If you have time, you can read for, before tomorrow. And you'll see these verses are coming from there. And it says, Hashem adeneinu ma'ad yoshim cha b'chol ha'aretz asher tnah otcha la shamayim. Right? How great is your, and this is where they get it from, how great is your glory in this world, in the aretz, but you should give your glory to the shamayim, meaning the angels are saying, save your glory for us. Why give it to humans? They're, nobody is, right? They sin, they're terrible, right? We saw that all over this, right? This, this page. So Amar, lo ha'kadosh baruchu Moshe, we'll stop here, okay? But what does God say to Moshe? God doesn't answer the angels. He says to Moshe, you deal with them. You answer them, okay? Now, this is all about what's going on here. It's angels versus God, right? Angels is always something that God controls. Humans are something that we have control over. And instead of God answering for Moshe, God says, Moshe, you answer for yourself, okay? Tomorrow we'll see what's Moshe's response, okay? His initial response we'll see is he doesn't want to. I'll just read one more line. Amar shama just like when God said to Moshe, go to Paro, and he didn't want to go, 
Also here he says, they're going to destroy me. What, what, what am I before an angel? They're going to burn me with their, with their mouths. So what does God say to him? Amarlo, I'll be your back. I'll give you backing, but hold on to my chair and you do it though. It's up to you. Okay. How did they understand this? It's an incomprehensible passage from Eo. What's Parshas? God gave him from his presence and made like a cloud on top of Moshe and gave him the strength to answer the angels. And tomorrow we'll find out what did Moshe answer the angels and how did he, how did he get through this obviously difficult situation where here he is standing in front of the angels having to plead his case and say, by what virtue are we deserving of the Torah?